but the great renunciation when the prince rode out into the Indian full moon night on the white stallion Kantaka, abandoning the life in the palace, abandoning the life in the pleasure palace, and going out, although he had no experience in the world, and although his son had just been born, and although he was destined to become a Chakravati emperor, a returning emperor, who would rule in the whole world, or at least one continent, only by the power of Dhamma, and would have no, any achievement you can possibly think of in terms of worldly life, and he left it all behind without distinction. And we can talk about what was leading up to that. Because it wasn't just in one go that he suddenly decided not to go away. It was a process. And he already had a prediction, as you're probably aware of. Now, after he was born, as what customary in that time for someone important, uh, the son of a king, the Brahmins made predictions about his future and the fortune telling. There was already there were already you know, all these uh, miraculous signs at birth, and then uh, the king had the Brahmins formally summoned, and they all said you know, that this child is so exceptional that he has only two ways open. Either if he stays in the household life, stays a prince, becomes a king, he would end up being a real-turning emperor, Chakravati Raja, the ruling the whole thing only by the power of righteousness without war or violence. However, if he decides to leave the household life behind and he goes forth as an ascetic, then he would become a Buddha, who would, put, who would pull away the veil from this world, the veil of ignorance, and open the path to the deathless, to countless millions. This was the judgment of four Brahmins, but the youngest had a dissenting voice, and he said, I'm sure about that child. There's only one thing going to happen. He definitely will go forth and will become a Buddha. And that youngest one was the Brahman Kondanya, who later became you know, the very first disciple of the Buddha, the first one to realize the Dhamma listening to the first sermon. There's also the very touching scene when the old spiritual teacher of the king, the spiritual teacher of King Suddhodana, the wise sage Asita, who had retired and living a hermit's life. And uh, he couldn't really attain Nibbana because the Buddha was not yet teaching. And although he was wise and uh, practicing very well, and if the teaching of the Buddha is not available, it's just extremely difficult. But he had a samadhi, and he had the ability in the hot season, because the Buddha was born in the hot season, he had the ability to go for his afternoon siesta, for the afternoon rest, by psychic power to the Tavatingsa heaven. And it's not so hot there, like in India in May. And when he did that on the day that the Buddha attained enlightenment after under the Bodhi tree. And all the devas were celebrating like he had never seen it before like that. They were dancing in joy. And when he inquired as to the cause of their mirth and celebration, more than he had ever experienced, and they explained that the Bodhisattva had been born and uh, that countless beings will attain Nibbana and even more will attain to Dova, Deva Loka and reborn uh, in different levels of the Deva Loka and they're so happy about that, Mudita and Anumodana. 
So the wise sage uh, immediately went back to the human world and hearing that this is in the palace of uh, his disciple, King Sudodana, and he straight away went to the palace, even at night time, which an ascetic normally would never do. But this was so extraordinary and very surprised now that this old ascetic visiting him at night time, the king invited him in and he demanded to see the child. So he had to even go into the inner chambers, in the kind of the hall room where the uh, wives of the king are well protected. And he walked right in there. And they showed him the child and he would not look and intensively study the features and appearance of the little baby, newborn baby. And after staring at the newborn baby you know, for quite a long time, do you know what happened? He started crying. Can you imagine the poor mother and the father getting very worried you know, this sacred sage is coming, staring at their child for a long time, then he starts crying. And they're asking, oh, I hope there's no misfortune for our child. And he immediately consoles them and he says, no, no, this one uh, is supreme. There's absolutely no obstruction for him because uh, he will become uh, a Buddha. He has got the 32 marks and there are only two courses open, either we turning emperor or if he goes forth, he will become a Buddha. But I'm crying because I also can see that my lifespan is not long enough. And by the time when he will attain supreme somebody, I will have already you know, passed away. So I will not be able to get these teachings and this is why I'm crying. Do you notice how lucky you are? Because you have that teaching. So this is a saintly old and a spiritual teacher of the Buddha's father and he already has samadhi and the psychic power that he could go to Tavatingsa heaven and he ended up crying realizing he also had the very good fortune of meeting the Bodhisattva he ended up crying because he would pass away and not hear the teaching so you're much better off but we have to use that opportunity, we have to use that jackpot win, we have to claim it. I always like to say you know, if we have the teaching of the Buddha and you're in a human life and you're reasonably healthy, mentally alert, and you made some contact and even have faith in the Buddha's teaching, you know, then not to practice would be just like winning the jackpot and the lottery and then being too lazy not to claim it, to pick it up. <laughs> would be unthinkable. Because it is winning the jackpot. So the king had got the prediction now and from his old spiritual teacher, Sage Asita. He got the prediction from the Brahmins and what do you think which was the favorite of these two possible options in the king's and the father's opinion? Of course, he wanted him to be a king and the most powerful king ever, his son. And then they prided themselves, the Sakyans, that they are an unbroken lineage of hundred kings reaching back in the far distance. We have the idea you know, of his son you know, being sitting in the forest you know, and begging for his food in rag robes, even if he is a Buddha or whatever, you know, that didn't appeal to the king. So he felt he has to try his very best to keep the Bodhisattva in the worldly life. And what did he do to keep him there? Have you heard that? You know, to swamp him with uh, sensuality and sensual pleasures and hide all dukkha, hide all dukkha. 
in the later scriptures, in particular in the famous Buddha Chavita, which was the, the best known poem describing the life of the Buddha in ancient India by Ashwagosha. You know, that is still uh, described in great elaborate detail. You know, they say that they would even remove flowers before they wither, so he wouldn't even get to see a withered flower. If any of the servants, that there would be no old servants, on, only young and attractive. And if anyone got sick, you know, they would quickly be removed and sent somewhere else so that he wouldn't see even a sick person. So the idea was you know, to keep him in this bubble of you know, perfect happiness and everything is fine and everything is enjoyable here in this world, in the pleasure palace. And it often strikes me you know, that some of that stuff is you know, really archetypal, it's almost you know, expressing psychological truth as a metaphor. Because I think King Sudodana is not the only father who is doing that, not the only parent, isn't it? Many other parents may try to do that with the children. And even more interesting, there's usually a King Sudodana in our own heart, this kind of the internal father, who tries not to keep us confined in the pleasure palace or twice not to blend out, to blind out, to remove any sign of Dukkha. In particular when we are younger, there's some faculty in our mind as who's doing the same. You may not be a princess or a prince or a bodhisattva, you may not have a king as a father putting you into a true pe treasure, pleasure palace, no, but even if we live a, a normal life, uh, there's often some internal faculty who is trying to do that, hiding all dukkha. And of course he got him married with the most beautiful girl in the country. But one day you know, the Bodhisattva felt he should see something of the kingdom that he's later meant to rule. I mean, he's a very wise person from his parami, and understanding then that he is destined to become this super powerful king, and the son of the king anyhow, inhabiting the kingdom already. And he felt he has to know something about it. So he wanted to go out and ask his father, he can go on an outing was quite common for Indian royalty that they would amuse themselves, you know, usually al fresco going to a park, to a pleasure park. <laughs> so his father you know, arranged that for him. And then the charioteer Channa, who later also became a monk, as the person at charioteer, and it took him on the chariot and driving him to the pleasure grove that he can amuse himself with the this wife and the dancing girls and so on. But what happened? What happened on the way? Yeah, no, the first one was an old person. No, they apparently, at least no, this is how they dramatize it later, the king had not tried not to clean out not the whole course of the pleasure grove and doing the same like in the pleasure palace and getting the old people out of the way and making all very festive and adorning it with garlands. However, sometimes they say it was actually a deva manifesting as that or there's different versions around. In any case, he saw this old person and really hit him. Really hit him. And having never seen that, you know, he asked this uh, charioteer, what is that? Who is that? And Shanda explained to him, you know, this is what we call an, an old person. And he has lived for many years 
and uh, as he gets in older, the skin is getting wrinkled, and you know, he's bent over, he can't walk properly, and has lost all the beauty, and the hair gets you know, gray, falling out. And he's doddering along, he can't think clearly, and the eyes maybe dripping tears, can't speak properly, dueling, and so on. And then the, uh, the Bodhisattva continued the pressing his chariot here and he asked, but is it only, only him? Is it only this person? How about me? How about my beautiful wife, Yasodava? How about my father? Do they also get old? And the Chanda explains, yes, absolutely everyone. Even your super beautiful wife, the most beautiful girl in the country, she will go the same course. And the Bodhisattva said, enough, we turn. I'm no longer interested in the pleasure grove. I had enough for today. And he started in the brooding, contemplating old age. What is that? I will also end up like that. But, uh, sometimes when we read this story, it sounds almost a little bit, what I say, difficult to believe. Can someone be so naive? And is that even possible? But again, uh, there's also a deep metaphorical meaning. Because uh, you may not have a charioteer like the Buddha and the chariot and not a pleasure grove, no, but the same thing has probably happened to you. And going out Fortitude Valley in Brisbane, we may be in a car, and we're going out, we're trying to amuse ourselves, we're trying to enjoy life. Go out, party, do the good things, go on a cruise, travel to Paris, go to the good restaurant, and so on, and so on, go to the movies. Now, this is a pleasure grove. Pleasure grove is just a simile you know, for the central world. Uh, chariot is just simply how we go through life. And who is a chariot here? What is that a simile for? Uh, sati Sampajanya, and the mindfulness and wisdom. Because mindfulness and wisdom should be your chauffeur, your driver, driving you around in this world. And uh, we have, just like in Sudodan, uh, inside, uh, we have usually tried uh, to hide all this suffering. We just don't see it. Not literally, you can't really remove all old and sick people. And, uh, to some extent, we are actually doing that. Our whole society has become like that. The oldies into the nursing home, sickies and the sick people into the hospital, dead people to the undertaker, so we're actually doing the Sudodana thing, actually, quite quite extensively in our society. And then we go out and trying to amuse ourselves. But you may have bumped, at least the people here, I think everyone here has bumped into an old person. And what the Bodhisattva asked there, no, that was not naive at all. Have you ever really asked the question? And you see an old person, what is that? I mean, maybe you say, oh, you know, I'm, this is an old person, but what the Buddha, what the Bodhisattva did, he was really digging in and contemplating that. What, what is that really, old age? Because it is shocking. A couple of years ago, there was in Germany, they had a meeting for my high school year. I must have been 25 years probably, no? 25 plus? Yeah, but it was a 25 years meeting. Obviously, I didn't participate being a monk and being in Australia, but someone sent me photos. And the people are literally disfigured beyond recognition by old age, just at about age 50, or a little less even. Many of them I could not recognize, not having seen them for so long. If you see them regularly, you would recognize them. 
So I could literally say in a disfigured beyond recognition, I couldn't recognize him anymore. And it, then it dawned on me you know, that I'm probably just as disfigured as they. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't feel like that you know, for oneself. But this is my, my age group, and they all look really old. And so we have to ask you know, the same question from the charity, or from our faculty of wisdom and mindfulness. And have you done that? Have you really looked into that whole thing about old age? And then the next question, showing the great wisdom, Panya Parami, of the Bodhisattva, ne? asking, how about others? How about me? Now the others look old. Ne? Others are in the nursing home. I don't feel really like 55. It doesn't seem so long that I was young. and In high school even, it's quite easy to go back in the mind. But we become old ourselves. And then you got another song, Vega. You had enough of the pleasure growth. How do you manage that? How can you see that, see these old people, and then go out and amuse yourself? Uh, it is a shocking reality. And when you finally had recovered, and then the next outing, <laughs> finally we got through that, and then going for the next outing, and as you probably can anticipate, and he bumped into a sick person. Exactly the same thing. We're really asking, what is that? In that story, it just presented me as never seen a sick person. So completely naive, like a child, and he's now asking, what is that? But we can also take a little bit more deeply because we may have seen sick people, but we haven't really seen them. We haven't really looked into that. And we have missed out now asking the faculty of mindfulness and wisdom, now what, what is that really? Because if we do that, it becomes very difficult to amuse yourself. You get this in a song Vega, it really shakes you out of complacency, you know, this spiritual shock. It's one of these fascinating feelings, you know, as a Dukkha Vedana, but it's a good one, it's a spiritual wholesome Dukkha Vedana. Because you know, it induced the Bodhisattva you know, to abandon the pleasure grove and to contemplate, as some Vega does that, it doesn't feel nice. Once you start really looking into old age, sickness, death, it doesn't feel nice. But it's a Dukkha Vedana which is very beneficial because it can send you on a spiritual surge. And then the dead body being carried away there. And then finally, you know, the fourth outing, which was, what did he bump in? The renunciant. Exactly. The Samana and the Bodhisattva felt no, they look different. And he's, he's more restrained and he's calm and he looks more peaceful and there seems to be some peace or internal contentment and happiness which others don't have. And then uh, Chana a symbol for mindfulness and wisdom, they explained to him. And then he got the really the inspiration. He felt he should become like that person. That's why it's also good enough for monks to occasionally go out. A very powerful sight. And it's very, again, very archetypal. Because if you look around, the whole people dress, and nowadays the people dress in all kinds of matters, no, but a Buddhist monk, well, that's very simple, it's easily, easy to identify. The completely shaved, one shoulder, the robe, and a, whatever, and a brownish, warm, 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 simple color. There's this one monk uh, who died in Sri Lanka practicing he originally came from the US, one of the square states in, in the 19, must have been or early 
70s or something when he started. And uh, only a small town. I think it was partially uh, Sioux, indigenous, American background, partially. And he had never heard about Buddhism or anything in his whole family background. And he saw footage of the Vietnam War. And in that footage, he saw some monks accidentally, you know, coincidentally walking through the footage. And that struck him so much that he wanted to find out what what are they. And he had to go in even to a different town to get a library where he could get some books about Buddhism and inform him, say. And in the end, they ended up ordaining and practicing. And then uh, due to this very difficult condition, when he had 12, 12 veins or something, he died there in the forest. But a very diligent practitioner, but that was the site of Buddhist monks no? setting more can be very powerful. And they say just when the Bodhisattva came back, I, I think later some of that is probably a little bit dramatized. And it's difficult to discern what details never exactly like that. But never mind, they say just when he had seen the dead body and felt now he has to go forth. And then the message came that his wife had given birth to his first child, and a healthy young son. It was such a big thing. Now, even nowadays, it's a big thing. But in that Indian culture, and it was so big and important and so much a source of joy. But by now, the Bodhisattva resolved on, on renouncing. He saw just the danger. They say this is why he suggested the name uh, Rahula. Uh, like Rahu is obscuring the moon. It's like like it's not necessarily such an obs such an auspicious name. But he felt uh, that maybe uh, a fetter, something that may obstruct him from going forth. Got already noticed now how keen he was in the meeting his young child. So he resolved uh, to leave that very night. He resolved uh, to go without even saying goodbye to anyone. Because his father, apart from immersing him in sensuality, has also put out guards to you know, physically even stop him. And he was worried you know, that anyone may stop him. And he was worried if his, his wife, you know, who he loved dearly, would start to beg him you know, to stay behind, not to leave her alone, that he may not have the heart to leave her. And he was afraid you know, if he holds his son in his arms even just once that he would be unable to leave. So he sneaked out at night time, but they say that he wanted to have at least one last look on his baby, baby boy. So he snuck into the sleeping chamber of his wife and they say that she was holding the sleeping, both were sleeping, she was holding the sleeping baby on her chest but no, her hand obscuring the, the head and the face, so I couldn't couldn't see him. And he was worried if he gently takes her hand away, she may wake up and try to stop him, and he may be unable to go. So he decided not even to look at his little boy, never to hold or touch him, and to just go out. And uh, Chana accompanied him, and he was riding uh, on his mount, uh, the noble stallion Kantaka. The Chakravati king always has the, the seven treasures, and one is uh, the supreme horse. So he had, uh, had a very good horse. And uh, they say uh, that the horse could even sense that there's something very special happening, and uh, he neighed with great joy. But the devas would muffle the sound. When he was galloping through town, the devas would muffle the sound of the hooves. And they say when he came to the gate, which was heavily guarded because the king had got instructions to the soldiers, and no one can go out, not even the crown prince. And the devas just opened it. 
And I find this image is so evocative, with the Buddha endowed with the 32 marks, supreme beauty, in all his noble splendor, distinct to become a returning emperor, and now on the white horse, now riding out into the full moonlight in India, and crossing several rivers, crossing the river Anoma, and then getting off, cutting his hair with his sword. They also, they also say, this is how he has got what you see now, because one of the 32 marks is now that uh, he has got curly hair. Every Mahapuddhisa, the Buddha or the returning emperor has got curly hair. And they have got only one hair per pore. You can check. <laughs> <laughs> if you have one hair, one pore where two hairs are coming out, you've lost the plot already. And they all have to curl, and they have to curl to the right. And they say that when he cut off the hair, it was exactly two finger breadth, which is the limit the Buddha later gave for the monks. If they become two fingers long, then you have must cut. You can cut earlier. Two fingers or two months, whichever comes earlier. But they say that for the Buddha, it just stayed like this ever since he cut it with the sword. Which resolves the awkward issue of you know, having to assist the Buddha in you know, cutting his hair. Who would dare doing that? <laughs> so they say it was never necessary to do. They exchanged clothes with a poor person he met. And he gave his jewelry and everything to Channa to return. They say the horse died of grief and he arrived back you know, without his bodhisattva he loved so much and you know, he died of grief. He was straight away reborn in heaven. There's a stupa now. King Ashoka built a stupa also for the horse. It's quite touching. He did an important job in getting the bodhisattva out. So it's a beautiful story externally, uh, imagining that happening those days in India, evocative images. I think it's also a very powerful internal psychological truth expressed in that. And for me, both works, now I, I quite have uh, faith and confidence now that the basics of the story are all correct. But at the same time, now the psychological truth is also there. Whenever we are lazy or negligent in our practice, and whenever we are in danger of getting lost in the pleasure palace, well, we have to do the same thing. We have to really ask that question. What is this when you see a sick person? When you see a dead person? We had quite a bit now with coronavirus. But unfortunately, in many people, it just leads to agitation. They had it in their face all the time, not so much now anymore, but constantly this, every day how many people died from COVID worldwide in your country. And it caused a lot of anxiety because people try to push it away and then they get death shoved into their face, the death and sickness. But they don't respond like the bodhisattva, but they respond by trying to push it away again. And then you get all this agitation. On the other hand, uh, the last two years were also a great opportunity in it to, to what the Bodhisattva did and uh, asking the faculty of mindfulness and wisdom, our charioteer, what is it and what are the implications? And whatever we feel is important doing, uh, whatever we are lost in, uh, what we have uh, all kinds of aspirations, we can just ask the question what is left of that in a hundred years. We want to meditate, but there's maybe something important. First, getting to retirement, or first, getting the kids to school, or first, 
going on this one course, which you never have done. Right, if we contemplate an impermanence, all these things which appear important, holding you back from the practice, you know, what will be left in a thousand years? Family is important. In a hundred years, you know, what will be left of your family? In a thousand years, is there a single person who will remember anyone in your family in a thousand years? You've got to be a very um, important and big, famous person to be remembered in a thousand years. And then what is left in a million years? <laughs> so if we contemplate like that, you know, all these things which appear important, you know, they just fade away. And then hopefully maybe we can at least metaphorically, in a wide out into the wide open full moon night. We can still see the gates there. There's some, not sure that's the original ones, but there are some foundations of the gate of Kapilavatu. The actual location of Kapilavatu is controversial, in my personal opinion. Having looked into the available information, I think the Nepalese are right, that the one on the Nepalese side is probably the original one. The one on the Indian side may have been just a later established one after King Vidudaba and the slaughtered the Sakyans and maybe just remained as established that there. It was very beautiful to stand at these gates where the Bodhisattva would wide out and be willing to leave everything behind. He had everything going to him, going for him, the most beautiful wife, most powerful all indulgences you can think of. The stint for the wheel turning emperor. But he could see through it old age, sickness, death, and the sight of the ascetic. There was enough to wipe that all away. It was more powerful than the internal King Sododana. And we have that King Sododana in our mind important to watch that, all this faculty in your mind and is trying to remove Dukkha. And now we can pretend that there is no old age sickness and death for me, even if they're all dying around me, <laughs> if they're all getting sick around me, it's quite amazing. And the faculty of delusion uh, can do that. You may not have the servants like King Sododana can order the servants uh, to take away the wilting flowers. But the faculty of delusion, uh, you can just take away the wilting flowers yourself and put new ones and delight in the new ones. How beautiful it all is. And immediately forget about the wilted away ones. So sometimes it's not necessarily very um, elaborate reflections. We can go through all the links of dependent origination in Pali and in English, investigate that. But sometimes that is a ma lot of thinking the way some people do that. You, know, you can just go to these very basic ones. Simple things, an old person, a sick person, a dead person, dead body. And then really asking, what is that? Is that maybe also me? And all the important things in the world, you know, just fades away. These very simple, basic things, no old age, sickness, death, you know, is quite enough to completely you know, destroy all that. Isn't it great uh, seeing Paris, at least having been once in life to Paris? Okay, so you can go to Paris, but you can only go to funerals, into the terminal cancer station in hospital, and into old age homes. 
Would you still be interested going to Paris if that's all you're going to get to see? Completely gone. Eh? This is not really what you wanted to see from Paris. All it's sick and dead Parisians. Eh? It's not you want to go there and to maintain this delusion, this pleasure palace. That world is fun and enjoyable and that I can get so much happiness. It takes coverage widening out there. It hasn't been out at all, just pampered all the time. And it just goes out. Oh, 